Hello everybody. As you can see on the slide, my name is Olivera Petrak and I'm psychologist from University of Applied Health Sciences from Zagreb, Croatia. In this, this presentation is part of a trained, uh, trainer pain school education, which occurred in Ljubljana, Slovenia as part of Upscale Erasmus Plus project. I'm going to talk about how to make collaborator of your patient how to motivate our patients in rehabilitation process. Persistent pain is an enormous health issue which strikes millions of people all over the world. It is very hard to estimate precise percentage, but we can expect that population with this problem will grow because of a contemporary lifestyle. As Dennis uh, Turk in Beverly Thorne's book, Cognitive Therapy for Chronic Pain, well said, I will quote him, People will, with acute pain can often get help and receive significant relief from primary health care providers. But people with persistent pain, they become enmeshed in the medical system as they travel on an often futile pilgrimage, visiting lots of doctors, specialists, therapists of different kind, from one laboratory test or imaging procedure to another, like in a never-ending story in a continuing search for exact diagnosis and with hope that finally someone will treat their pain successfully. As a consequence, persistent pain confronts people with a series of ongoing stressors that compromise all aspects of their lives. For many of them, you can say the pain becomes the central focus of their lives. Because of the chronic pain, they withdraw from society, they may worsen interpersonal relationships and alienate family and friends. They can give up their job completely, sometimes, which can lead to more extensive physical and social isolation. Persistent pain leads to poor quality of life. Also, on many occasions, they meet the idea that their problem is of psychiatric nature or that they even malinger on the one hand. On the other hand, their situation can implicate that they have an undiagnosed life-threatening disease, which is very fearful and stressful. So it's not surprising at all that such patients become preoccupied and overwhelmed with lots of negative emotions such as fear, anger, helplessness, hopelessness, frustration, isolation, depression, despair even, connected with disappointment in healthcare system. Furthermore, persistent pain affects not only the patient but also causes difficulties in the family or at the workplace. Family members feel increasingly hopeless and distressed when patients' disability and emotional suffering increase, medical costs also, while income and available treatment options decline. Health practitioners can also feel frustrated as available medical treatment options are exhausted while condition of the patients is the same or even worse. At the workplace, employees with chronic pain are frequently absent from work and others must take over their responsibilities. Consequently, employers and co-workers grow resentful because productivity declines and person with persistent pain becomes unreliable in working process. As a result of persistent pain, people often experience major sleep disturbance, which becomes a problem by itself and can make coping mechanisms with persistent pain even weaker. Patients drastically change their, their everyday routine, daily functioning, they worry about the future, and these thoughts, feelings, behaviors will amplify distress and bring out inactivity. Inactivity will lead to body deterioration, as physically, also psychologically, which will produce disability, loss of independence, and more pain or harm, like in a vicious circle. I think today we are all aware what physical activity does to our organism. This kind of patients often doesn't have enough trust in the medical system. They have been disappointed so many times that they don't have strength to listen to another medical practitioner to have more hope that one day they will feel better. For example, if you are the third, fifth or eighth specialist who works with one patient who feels pretty much hopeless, you are not in a good start position. This type of patient is not so willing to listen to you to collaborate like acute patients are. Research has shown that there is a strong association between a patient's trust in their healthcare provider and how well they follow treatment recommendations. 
Other problem is that we have to work with a patient who is often a passive recipient of the biomedical curative approaches, like medication, surgery, manual therapy, rather than exercises. Patients ask to be fixed, if not demand sometimes. But this is not just their fault. Health providers in start have bigger power than patients. They have big authority and more influence in health system. Specialized knowledge, access, access to privileged information, and patients can feel that they don't have control over the situation and are not responsible for their state. Now, I have a little task for you. Please think about and write down what are the conditions that can enhance the patient's trust. Maybe you can think about ways, techniques, details with which you can increase patient's trust in you as a physiotherapist. What can be important and why? Maybe some expensive furniture in a waiting room, long waiting list which proves that you are an excellent practitioner, plenty of other patients in waiting room, lots of certificates on the wall behind your back or some communication techniques. We'll see. Probably a lot of things which popped into your head are part of therapeutic communication. Before you start with giving instructions, exercising, education, trying to change patients' behavior, it's important to work to struggle with patients' feelings and thoughts. Why is that so? because our feelings are influenced by our thoughts. This is a famous cognitive triangle, as you can see on the slide. There is a strong relationship between our thoughts, our feelings and our behaviors. Our thoughts change the way we feel, which subsequently changes the way that we act, our behavior, which then influences our thoughts. Without intervention, the process continues to repeat. Sometimes, when patients are overwhelmed with negative feelings, they are not capable to adequately listen, to receive new information, to memorize. So you, you just can't skip the feelings. Also, we have to move her or him from their passive point of view to be an active collaborator in pain self-management strategies. Self-management strategy is aimed not at eliminating the pain totally, because with chronic pain, this is often impossible but rather at increasing function in spite of the pain. For a lot of patients, this will be a very new approach, which will require a complete change in the way they think about their illness. That can be a very difficult task for some of them. So, it is probably unrealistic to expect a typical patient with pain to adopt behavioral self-management strategies without first helping them to change their mindset. An unfortunate misconception is that patients over-report the level of pain they actually feel, have more pain behaviors and greater dysfunction than are warranted by the physical aspects of the pain. Why is the reason? What is the reason for that? We have experience of pain only because our brain interprets the stimulus as pain. Numerous situations are known when people had serious injuries but felt very little or no pain at all. Pain is in our head but not in common understanding of that proverb, but literally. Pain is the perception, and like all perceptions, it is formed through the processes in our brain. How will we perceive pain depends on a lot of different personal and situational characteristics, such as gender, age, previous experience with pain, personality traits, our emotional state, fatigue, cognitive processes such as meaning of the pain, expectations of pain, and so on. What is crucial in transformation process from patient's passive to active role? Effective communication strengthens the working alliance with patients and increases their motivation to adopt and work on a rehabilitation plan. Therapeutic communication is a whole collection of verbal and nonverbal techniques that prioritize the physical, mental, emotional well-being of patients, so it's based on holistic approach to patient. Therapeutic communication encourages the patient to express feelings and ideas and conveys acceptance and respect. But there is no universal prescription of what is a therapeutic communication technique and what is non-therapeutic communication technique. Everything depends on the context. 
this bipolar classification is not totally justified. Some techniques, for example, asking personal question, which is classified as non-therapeutic uh, technique because it is kind of noisy behavior, could be therapeutic in some other moment. Actually, you sometimes need to ask personal questions because it's part of the diagnostic process. For example, if a woman has urinary problems, incontinence, it would be useful to know how sexual intercourse works. Is it painful for her? But in such situation, you must announce that you will ask a personal question and ask for permission also. You have to explain why this information is important for you, not just ask it suddenly as a punch in the face. Also, therapeutic communication techniques may sound very sterile, tensely and artificial, so we have to practice, practice them a lot and then adjust to normal speech. Folksified. That's an expression I found on a website of Integrative Pain Science Institution, and I like it very much. Folksified. Make it understandable to ordinary people. So why a therapist ought to bother with therapeutic communication techniques? Because frankly, they are hard work. But quality care goes beyond just completing a regular physiotherapy for your patient. You want to provide quality care, I hope, not just the basic patient therapy. And also think about what is the alternative if you don't want to learn or you think that uh, therapeutic communication techniques are not important. Then you will have spontaneous conversation. But then you, uh, you risk a lot because you... If you have aggressive patients, spontaneous reaction is to shout or to be also aggressive. And that's not acceptable behavior. Nobody expects expect you to be perfect to use all techniques. Actually, the most important thing is to observe the patient's reaction. If you made a mistake, you could always apologize, discuss, elaborate what you wanted to say. There are a lot of therapeutic communication techniques help the practitioners can incorporate into their practice. Their order in this presentation is random. I will not talk much about those techniques which are very famous, but more about some less known. For example, using silence. At times it's useful to not speak at all. Think about it for a while. Is it easy for you to handle the silence? Some people have a hard time bearing it and they, then they start bubbling usually about some personal or unimportant topics. I can recognize myself here. I wasn't good in handling silence. I, I'm still not very good, but practice have helped me. Deliberate silence can give both health practitioners and patients an opportunity to think through and gain insight into the situation. It may give patients the time and space they need for bringing up a new topic, especially if it is a delicate one. Your patients need time to collect and organize his thoughts, gather courage and decide what to say next. Then accepting. Sometimes it's necessary to acknowledge what patients say and affirm that they've been heard. Acceptance isn't necessarily the same thing as agreement. It can be enough to simply make eye contact and say, yes, I understand. Patients who feel their clinicians are listening to them and taking them seriously are more likely to be receptive to care. But I would recommend using the phrase, I understand, with great caution. Because sometimes patients feel so lonely in their suffering that they couldn't believe someone who is healthy can understand them. You can easily get an answer such as, how can you understand me? You can walk, you can run or do whatever you want. Did you have to give up your daughter's wedding due to, the, due to pain? It's impossible for you to understand me. Also, in some situations, this is not enough to cause patients feeling of accepting. Patients could think that medical provider is just kind or just talks in phrase. Instead of that, uh, you can say, I follow what you are saying. Then we have given recognition or use a firm desired, uh, a firm desired behaviors. Recognition acknowledges a patient's behavior and highlights it without giving an overt compliment. 
let your patients know that you are aware of their efforts. We, our culture, a Croatian culture, but maybe even wider, maybe Mediterranean culture, we all cherish compliments very much. But this is just my opinion. Don't take me for a word. Okay. Croatian culture, we cherish compliments very much and, and overuse it sometimes, especially in communication with children. But is it always good to give a compliment? A compliment can sometimes can be taken, sometimes be taken as condescending or patronizing, especially when it concerns a routine task like making the bed or going to the toilet. It could sound we treat patients like children. However, saying something like I noticed you mastered all the exercises, draws attention to the action and encourages it without requiring a compliment. One technique is offering self, uh, offering your time and presence. Hospitalization can be a lonely, stressful uh, period and then when clinicians offer their time, it shows uh, they value patients and that someone is willing to give them time and attention. Offering to stay for lunch, watch a TV show together, or simply sit with patients for a while can help boost their mood. Giving road openings. Uh, therapeutic communication is often most effective when patients direct the flow of conversation and decide what to talk about. So, from time to time, giving patients a broad opening such as what's in your mind today, or what would you like to talk about, or just what's up. Talking with young patient, for example, can be a good way to allow patients an opportunity to discuss what's on their mind. So use open-ended questions or at least start conversation with open-ended question. Active listening. Active listening is basic, really, communication technique. And I, I think it's well known, but I can't miss it. It's, it's necessary to, to say, to mention active listening. By using non-verbal and verbal cues, such as nodding and saying, I see, clinicians can encourage patients to talk, uh, to continue talking. Active listening involves showing interest in what patients have to say, acknowledging that you are listening and understanding. Clinicians can offer general leads, such as what happened next, uh, cues are eye contact, nodding, smiling if it is appropriate, leaning towards the patient, ignoring disturbances from background, asking questions, seek, seeking for explanations, approving with words and sounds to be focused, be focused, but also be careful. Don't ask too many questions on the very beginning of conversation. First, let patient to throw out, to vent, ventilate what they want to say. Seeking clarification is similar to active listening. Asking patients for clarification when they say something confusing or ambiguous is important. Saying something like, I'm not sure I understand, can you explain it to me, helps clinicians ensure they understand what's actually being said and it can help patients process and clear their ideas. You can also use phrases like, uh, uh, did I understand you correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, I wonder if, if, and so on. Clarifying, on the other hand, uh, means to assess whether the patient understood the information. Making observations. Observations about the appearance of behavior or patients can help draw attention to areas that might pose a problem for them. Observing that they look tired shows that uh, we care and may prompt patients to explain why they haven't been getting much sleep lately. Making an observation that they haven't been eating much uh, may lead to the discovery of a new symptom or that he or she has problem with uh, his denture. Summarizing. It's frequently useful for clinicians to summarize what patients have said. This demonstrates to patients that, clinicians, uh, that, that the clinician was listening and allows the clinician to document conversations. Ending the summary with a phrase like, does this sound correct, gives patients 
patient's explicit permission to make corrections if they are necessary. One other very useful technique is paraphrasing. Paraphrasing means restating the patient's message, which has two aims. The first aim is to show to patients that we are listening to them. Tell the patient what you heard and understood so he or she could have better understanding of themselves, and this is the second aim. But also paraphrasing encourages them to continue talking. Repeat the most important information using phrases such as so you see things in this way or from your point of view it looks like or do you actually want it to say that and so on. Reflecting. Reflecting means mirroring, like you put a mirror in front of patient's face and help him or her to become aware of their feelings, of their state. You would be very surprised if you find out how many people are not connected with their feelings. It's hard for them to even recognize what feeling they experience. So help patient to make aware connection between body and emotions, between uh, behavior and emotions, such as, I see you bow your head. Does this mean this topic is uncomfortable for you? or you seem very angry, you seem very nervous. It's not always easy to recognize exactly what the patient is feeling or thinking. In unclear situations, it's better to apply the clarification technique instead of hasty reflection. If we underestimate or exaggerate what the patient experiences, he may think that you criticize his experiences. Literal verbal ref reflection or paraphrasing can give the impression of repetition like parrot talk, which is not considered as a part of therapeutic communication. Uh, I forgot to tell you before that phrase I understand does not always have to be convincing. Because this phrase is too often used uh, when we actually want to cut the conversation to interrupt the patient with a meta message Stop telling me about it. I don't have time. I don't want to hear about it. So I repeat, be careful with this phrase. Focusing. Sometimes during a conversation, patients mention something particularly important. When this happens, health provider can focus on their statement, asking uh, direct questions uh, to discuss this uh, topic. Patients don't always have an objective perspective on what is relevant to their case. So focus on key issues in the conversation. This technique seems to be opposite of giving broad openings, which we mentioned before. But one technique does not exclude the other. The point is in balance of giving enough space to patient, but also to reach the information which is important for you. Medical practitioners should only apply confronting after they have established trust with patient. It can be vital to the care of patients to disagree with them, present them with reality or challenge their assumptions. Confronting helps the patient realize his uh, or her inconsistencies in feelings, attitudes or beliefs. When used correctly, confrontation can help patients break destructive routines or understand the state of their situation. Hope. Offering realistic hope. People sometimes have need to be comforted. They seek comfort. Ask you openly, tell me that everything will be all right. But you mustn't do that. Don't fall into that trap because you are responsible for them and if things don't go okay, that would incriminate you. You can say something like, we'll do everything we can, or you can express the level of probability, such as most people with your condition were better after this treatment, or 70% of population with your condition got well. Offer realistic hope that although the condition may be chronic, Patients can learn strategies to manage the impact the condition is having on their lives. Offering humor. Offering humor can keep patients in a more positive state of mind because humor decreases anxiety, stress, tension and pain. But make sure the patient understands what is being said. Not all humor is good humor because humor can be a tool for expressing aggression, hostility, manipulation, resistance, negation 
or covering up a problem and it could make messages unclear. Humor is appropriate when anxiety is mild or moderate, but don't use it to be tired patients where uh, very anxious or in panic. Be aware that humor is very culturally determined, so patients from different culture probably would not understand jokes typical for your area, your country. Using touch brings the sense of caring by holding patient's hand. But be very careful about when you will use it, how and with whom, especially today with lots of refugees from different countries. Gentle touch increases the patient's cooperation, while touch that is perceived as dominant or controlling has a negative effect on patients. Touch can be seen as inappropriate, like controlling, with sexual connotation. For example, you won't use touch when you have aggressive patient, but a sad one. Aggressive patient would see it as an attack. Then. Uh, using of a third-person statements to discuss uh, a self-management plan. Third-person statements convey information about what patients are doing who cope best with chronic conditions. They are much more effective than if or you statements, such as if you want to get better, you need to go to physical therapy, or you need to learn how to deal with your pain. Those type of statements can provoke patients to be defensive. A good example of third-person statement is uh, coping effectively with chronic pain requires everyday work on areas such as uh, exercise and different life, life activities. These are important to do even with the pain. Validate the experience of chronic pain. It is very common for chronic pain patients to fear clinicians will not believe them about level of their pain intensity and that they just want more pain medications. It can be helpful so you to, for you to communicate that you take the patient's pain experience at face value. Consider to acknowledge and to validate the patient's pain is what the patient says it is by saying something like, this is really a painful condition. Uh, lumbar pain syndrome is a painful condition. Avoid using I statements such as I know you have pain or I'm sorry you have pain as it potentially sets clinicians up for uh, defensiveness and negotiation during ongoing interactions. One of the specific techniques in work with chronic pain patients is to address how loss impacts many individuals with pain. Many pain patients want their old lives back. They fall into the trap of believing that they cannot work on improving other aspects of their life until they get rid of pain, and that expectation usually is not realistic. Usually patients are not capable to accept new approach at once. They need time for that. Patients often move through a cycle of grief before accepting their pain condition as chronic. So encourage patients to set functional goals to improve their quality of life, saying something like, statistics show that persistent pain is actually a silent epidemic which affects millions of people all over the world. But many of these people find that even their pain continues, there is a lot they can do to manage their pain. So we can start with setting goals related to improving your level of functioning and increasing your quality of life regardless of your pain intensity. And finally, the last technique I will mention is education about the limitations of pain medications. Many pain patients are not aware that pain medications will typically help with only about 50-60% of the pain. Often patients try to eliminate their pain with more and more pain medications only to find that the medications are no longer as effective even at higher dosage. Of course, they also have unwanted side effects. So be frank with your patients, educate them about the limitation limitations of medication use saying something like pain medication has not been found to eliminate all the pain. In fact, in fact, too high a dose of pain medication can cause other problems for you, such as, I don't know, digestive problems, addiction, and so on. Here is also helpful to use third-person statements. 
Finally, these are not all therapeutic communication techniques. For example, I didn't mention empathy, also very important communication technique, which requires per se one big lecture, or I didn't mention self-disclosure. We don't have enough time to explain all of them. But what I wanted to stress out once again, don't expect from yourself to be good at once in involving therapeutic communication into your work. Don't lose your hope if you make mistakes. There is no other way for getting better in therapeutic communication than to practice, practice and practice. Once again, therapeutic communication helps clinicians to build trust with patient, which is very important part of successful rehabilitation process. On the other hand, non-therapeutic communication causes patients to feel uncomfortable and untrusting. I hope this short presentation will be helpful for you. Thank you very much for your attention and goodbye.